on kingdom stories, parables that uh, Jesus told, stories that Jesus told to let us know the truth of the realities of the kingdom of God, where Jesus Christ is in charge, the way things should be here on earth, and the way things will be one day when Jesus comes again. Now, I um, choose these parables uh, in a way that's not scientific. It's a whole lot more art than science. Some of you have asked how we choose which parable we are going to address each week. And I have a list of the parables from uh, three of the Gospels that uh, have a lot of repetitive parables and then some that aren't. And each week um, after Sunday service is over, I begin to read the list and pray about which parable we should be in for the next week. Now, we're not in a series like we are in fall and spring. And so it's sort of a series with freedom, not like a series where you know each week where we're going to be like you will in just a couple of weeks. And so I asked the Lord, where are we supposed to be? What is it our church needs to hear of all the different parables? And there are a bunch. Which one is the one for the week? And I pray and I trust that God gives me a sense of the right one. I, I hope that it's the right one most of the time. I think most of the time that God blesses the, uh, the word when it goes out. All the time he blesses his word when it goes out. And I think it accomplishes its purpose if we're willing to listen. So today is an unusual parable. It's a warning parable. Now, it's not like the Good Samaritan. It's not like the, um, the parable of the prodigal son. This is a warning parable. And Jesus talked about this theme or this subject several times. You and I have talked about this theme or subject a couple of times. And it's one that makes Christians uncomfortable. It makes us defensive. And um, we begin to battle our own pride. I might even say self-righteousness. And it occurs in Matthew, in the end of the book of Matthew, or toward the end of the book of Matthew, in a section of scripture that we call the Olivet Discourse. And the Olivet Discourse was a teaching that Jesus gave on his second coming, when he's coming back. And the disciples wanted Jesus to come again soon. I don't know how many of you guys want Jesus to come again soon. Um, and and I, I'd like to say I want Jesus to come again soon, but when we say Jesus come again soon, it brings with it a lot of, of implications. Because when Jesus comes again, not only will he take those of us who put our faith and trust in him to be with him and be with him forever, but those who've rejected Christ and decided not to become followers of Christ will never have another chance. And when Jesus comes again, the decision that a person has made for or about Christ is final. And so when we say, Jesus, hurry, I get it because it means that this world can become a distant memory, that the pain and sadness and disappointment and frustration can all be a thing of the past. But it also means that those folks who we love, people perhaps in our family, our close friends, maybe even some here today who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, it means that, that the time to choose is over. And so the disciples kept asking Jesus, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? Because you've told us you're going to die. It sounds terrible. You've told us that, you know, things are not going to end well for us. That doesn't sound great, but we're in. So when are you going to come back? And when are you going to right all these wrongs? When's all this bad stuff going to be over? And Jesus was cautioning them. He was saying, I am going to come, but no one's going to know when. It's going to surprise you and you need to be ready. And he tells a parable, a story. And it was the story of the 10 virgins. And it seems like it's kind of a random story, just kind of stuck in Matthew chapter 25. But I hope to explain to you why it's far more important than that. So let's read this together. At that time, at the time that Jesus comes again, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, we should talk for a second about weddings. You guys want to talk about weddings for a second? I don't like weddings. I've told you that. I'm not like super opposed to weddings. I'm not like against them philosophically. It's just sometimes weddings get stressful. Um, sometimes weddings bring out the worst in people. And in Jesus' day, these weddings could be seven days long and could certainly um, be times of celebration, but um, always times that were eventful or memorable. And the way that weddings were organized and structured back in Jesus' day is a young couple sometimes even young, young, like elementary age, would be paired together by their parents. Now, how many here think parents should arrange marriages for their kids? Anybody? I, I, 
no, nobody but just me and a couple of others who think that we know so much better than our children do. And if they would just let us choose their spouse, actually, I could not have chosen a better spouse for my oldest son, Richard, than he chose for himself. And so I've, that theory has been proven wrong by my daughter-in-law, but it just seems like we should be able to choose. Well, back in Jesus' day, you could choose and they would pair them up and the kids didn't have much to say about it. And they would go through an engagement period and then they would go into a betrothal. The betrothal was when the dads got together and made a contract. They wrote up the contract. They um, talked about a dowry. They kind of figured out what the arrangements were going to be. And the betrothals, when it became official, it was binding. The dads would slip away. The groom-to-be would hand the bride-to-be a cup of red wine and say, do you want to marry me? And hold her, or hand her the wine. And if she drank uh, out of the, the cup of red wine, it meant yes. And if she didn't, it meant another contract, another bride. I don't know. I don't think that ever happened. But when she drank the red wine, it symbolized a blood covenant, the covenant between the husband and wife, and also the symbolism that marriage is supposed to have between people and Jesus, representing Jesus' relationship to God. So the groom would take off and go back to his home. And oh, it was traumatic. The bride-to-be would have to say, when are you coming back for me? When are you coming back for me? And the groom would say, only the father knows. Only my father knows. I have to go and I have to prepare a place for you and then I'll come back and get you. Does that sound familiar? To those of you who have been in church for any period of time, for those of you who haven't, this is just a random set of words, but for those who've been around church for a while, these should be triggers in the best possible way because they sound a lot like things that Jesus said. So then the groom-to-be would go back to his father's house and begin to design a room or build a room. And then at some point, the father would tell the groom-to-be, go back and get your bride. So he would get all of his groomsmen together and they would wait until dark because they wanted everyone to see it needed to be a pageant. And they would enter the town where the bride lived or her part of town or her street. And then the, the, the bride and all of her bridesmaids were supposed to be ready to go. And to be ready, it meant you had a torch and you had to have oil for your torch and you had to be ready for the groom to come. And then you would light the torch. And then when the two parties met together, then all of them together with lighted torches, the bridesmaid and the groomsmen would travel to the groom's home where they would have a party that was started with an agreement, like a marriage vow ceremony, seven days sometimes of celebration, the consummation of the marriage and then life together. Simple enough, different than our marriages or our weddings today, but yet really beautiful and really significant. So the story here of the 10 virgins were the 10 bridesmaids. And the Bible says at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamp and their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom when they were supposed to. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Now, oil was necessary for a lamp to be lit. You guys tracking with me? We have batteries and flashlights. So it's like having a flashlight with no batteries. You have to have batteries for your flashlight. You had to have a flask of oil. The flask sometimes you would keep with you because you always wanted to be ready. You didn't know when the wedding ceremony was gonna start, when the bridegroom would come. You just knew that when the warning came, you had to be ready to go and meet the bride-to-be and then travel and the seven days of ceremony. And so their one job as a bridesmaid was to, to have their oil ready. Anybody been a bridesmaid here? Most people? And you guys are not really interacting with me today. I want to come down. Thank you. Most of you men didn't raise your hands, but most of you women raised your hands. What do bridesmaids have to do? Bridesmaids have to buy shoes that are uncomfortable and dresses they'll never wear again, right? And then they have to go and go through parties and ceremonies and rituals that everybody acts like are fun, but most of the time they're not having that much fun. See, I'm a little cynical when it comes to weddings. The one job that they had, the one job the bridesmaids had was to make sure that there was oil with them. The wise ones took oil, but some did not. The bridegroom was a long way in coming and they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. Let's move on. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, 
Give us some of your oil so that our lamps won't go out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Five bridesmaids were prepared. Five totally unprepared. Knew it was coming, yet did nothing about it. But when they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived, the virgins who were ready went with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour that the bridegroom will come. The bridegroom is Jesus. The bridesmaids are all indistinguishable from each other but we're not the same. Five had a personal relationship with Jesus, represented by the oil, grace. Five did not. When Jesus came, five were ready, and for five, it was too late. The thing that I think freaks me out a little about this parable is that the bridesmaids who represent professing Christians, professing Christians, church people, people who fill seats in churches all across our country and our world, looked the same. They acted the same. Perhaps even some thought they were the same. But yet, when the time came, could not have been more different. How do you know which five you're a part of? Well, in whom or what do you place your faith? We get weird about this, we Christians. Of course I'm a Christian. Stop asking me. I don't want to think about it. It's stressful, but yet it's important. I remember as a young man growing up in church, and I have more church than most people could ever have church. If we were going to compare church attendance, I would beat you. And if not, I mean, we would have to go to the mat and go to the calendar and go to our moms because I'm telling you, I got more church attendance than most people. And I can recall a time when I was six years old, my earliest memory of me thinking that I became a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ. And at six, I think I understood. I think I gave my life to Christ. At eight, I got baptized, which is a public profession of faith. A few years later, I wasn't 100% sure, didn't really understand, you know, I wasn't, you know, confident, made what we call back in the day a rededication. This is all language that some of you are familiar with and some it's new to and it's just the way we talked back in the day. In high school, I sat in a church in the balcony back in the back and I had a pastor named Adrian Rogers who would ask a question with a deep voice that sounded like an Old Testament prophet. Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved, right? That wasn't even nearly deep enough. And it would freak me out. And I'd be like, oh man, this is like God's talking to me. And the first time I could ignore him and like, ah, you know, la, 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 la. And then the second time he said it, I couldn't ignore him. And I remember thinking, I'm not sure I'm saved. I don't know. But I'm a member of the youth council. I've been in church since I was negative nine months old. I even had a suit. I asked for a Bible when I was 12 years old for my birthday. I was like super saved. And then I thought, what if I'm not? What if I really need to give my life to Christ right now? And I'll just confess to you because we're friends, my first thoughts were, what's everybody else gonna think? If I'm not really a believer and I tell people I'm not a believer, a member of the youth council, Someone who is so good at church that they could go pro? I mean, what are people gonna think? They're gonna judge me. I'm gonna be embarrassed. I'm gonna have to get baptized again. There's no way I could do that. And so at that very young age, I, I, I struggled with the decision. Do I put the thought out of my mind? Or do I really wrestle with the reality of the warnings that Jesus gave repeatedly in scripture? Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? And if you do, what is it you're basing your knowledge on? I find it interesting that Jesus used 50% of the ladies representing those that are saved and 50% representing those that aren't. 
In the New Testament, Jesus talks about wheat and tares living hand in hand together, pew in pew, seat in seat. And to be careful because you can't see, you can't tell the difference, indistinguishable, but not identical. Don't pull the tares because you may damage the wheat. That sheep and goats live together. And when the disciples were asking Jesus, when are you going to come again? We want you to come again. Won't you please hurry and come again? Jesus said, listen, I'm coming again. And when I come, you better be ready. Because when I come again, the only decision that's going to matter for you for the rest of your eternity is the decision that you've made about me. Not about church or religion or buying a suit or joining a youth council, but the decision that you made about Jesus Christ. Have I confessed my sin and realized that only the blood of Jesus is sufficient to cover the penalty, not for your sin, not for the world's sin that's sort of misstepped and messed up, but for my sin that's enough to damn me to hell forever. And that me, I, Rick, need forgiveness, you feel free to insert your name. That I've done far more than necessary to put Jesus on the cross. And the only thing that saves me is my faith and my trust that I've put in Jesus and Jesus alone. And Jesus thought this was such an important question, such an important thought that not only did he remind us time and time again in the New Testament, but he put this parable in as the punctuation of one of the most encouraging and startling and sobering sections of teaching in the entire Bible. So my question to you is, which side of the 50-50 are you on? because there's no more important decision that we could make. And when you arrive at your conclusion, what is your conclusion based on? Now we're gonna come and talk more about that in a minute. But Jesus didn't mess around with this. And I'm sure his disciples took a step back. And this would have been their thought process, which I trust is our thought process right now as we enter into a time of singing. I examine my own heart. And I know you may not want to. I had a conversation with a friend in between services who said, man, I just don't even want to think about it. I'd rather just not think about it. This is just, this is not something I even want to deal with. I don't want to address it. I just want to, and I get that. That was me sitting there in that balcony many years ago at that church in Memphis, Tennessee. And then I had another conversation in between services where a friend of mine was like, man, I look at myself and I ask myself that question all the day, all the time, which side of the 50, 50 I'm on and he struggles. I I do things I shouldn't do and maybe I'm not and I don't know. And can you help me? Can you talk with me? And as we just chatted briefly, I reminded him that our security, our surety of salvation has absolutely nothing to do with our resume or our pedigree. It has to do with our faith, our faith in Christ and Christ alone. So as I said, we'll talk more about that in a minute. In this particular story, Jesus used the idea of marriage uh, intentionally on purpose because all of the people who heard this and who read this, especially back in the first and probably second century understood exactly what he was talking about. It was a beautiful process of being chosen, of acceptance, of commitment, of new life, of not looking back to the old life, of building something together that maybe is better than you ever thought you could have possibly built alone. And when Jesus was talking about this, they got it, but maybe we don't. And I was thinking about this a little further as um, this subject's really been weighing heavy on my heart. I mean, 50-50, it's not really a formula, but I mean, you know, there are a lot of people that obviously are confused about salvation. Why would people be confused? What would it be that we put our faith and our trust in? And I was thinking about another interaction of Jesus. It wasn't a parable, but an interaction. And there's a phrase I want to share with you that's really been sticking with me in my own mind and my spirit this week. 
it was the story of the rich young ruler. Now, I am neither of these, none of these. I'm neither rich, I'm not young, and I'm not a ruler. And Jesus had a conversation with a person who was wanting to make sure that, you know, when the role was called of yonder, he'd be there. That when the bridegroom came and collected the party, that he would be inside the house and the door wouldn't be shut. And so he says to Jesus, what is it I need to do to make absolutely sure that I'm going to be where I want to end up, you know, when all is said and done. And so Jesus meets him where he is. And it's a story not unfamiliar to you, but really important. And the phrase we're going to focus on, I I hope is going to really impact you as it has me. A certain ruler asked him, um, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one's good except God. Now that's familiar to you. And then he goes into the 10 commandments and he talks about keeping the 10 commandments. And um, Jesus is again, relying on this man's religious pedigree, on his resume, on his heritage that he grew up in church. And so then as the conversation continues, the man says to Jesus, I've done all of these things, but he didn't just say he's done them all. And let's look at this together. He said, all of these things I have kept since I was a boy. And there's three things here really important to pay attention to. The first thing is that this man, this certain ruler, he knew all the things that he was supposed to do. He had it right here in his head that he knew the Bible that he knew the stories. He knew the things that we should do and the things we should not do that identify us with the faith. He didn't stop there in this phrase. He said, all of these things I've kept, which means he didn't just know these things, but he actually tried to do these things that he tried to live in a way that was biblical, that was pleasing to, to God. And then he goes on and he says a third thing. He said, all of these things, I have kept since I was a boy, that he had a pattern, that he had a habit of living in a way that he thought was biblical and he thought was right. And so Jesus looked at him and with insight identified the problem with this man's, his profession. And he said, yeah, you've done the right things and you know the right stuff but your heart is divided. He said, you've given me most of you, but not all of you. And in this particular man, Jesus identified his fortune, but in you and in me, it could be anything, anything that we have withheld or kept from God. The God, I worship you with most of who I am. I give you almost all of who I am, but not everything. And so Jesus invited him and said, follow me, give me everything. And when the man heard this, he became very sad, impractical, unlikely, not gonna happen because he wanted to hang on to the thing that he hadn't trusted Jesus with yet. And Jesus isn't inter or interested in most of us. He's interested in all of us. And Jesus looked at him and he said, it's really hard for people who hold things back. In this case, his wealth to get into the kingdom of God because a person who wants to be inside the kingdom of God can hold nothing back. So when you answer the question, which of the group of brides, bridesmaids are you in? What answer do you come up with? Is it a list of things like this rich young ruler? All of these things I know and I've kept as best I could since I was a child or since last month or last year. Or is it, I have given everything I know about myself to everything I know about Jesus I've confessed my sin and asked for forgiveness. I believe who Jesus is, that he died on the cross to pay this price I couldn't pay. That he rose again, defeated sin's power over me. I believe in Jesus and I wanna follow him with my life. And for a person who puts their faith and trust in Jesus, holding nothing back, which doesn't just involve some things, it involves everything 
when a person gives all of themselves to Jesus, then when that day comes, whether it be death or Jesus coming again, we hear those words, welcome home. You were good and faithful. So what is it you're placing your trust in or who? So let's leave with these two things in mind. One, let's make absolutely sure that we are in the group that gets invited in. And number two, once we have made that decision, that conclusion in our own lives, would you ask God along with me, asking God to give us a passion to motivate us, to partner with him, taking responsibility for people in our lives around us who don't know Jesus, but for whom time is running out. Will we ask God not to allow us to have a blind eye to the spiritual pain of those who sometimes are so close, feeling like it's not our responsibility or our business, but to truly become part of what it is that God's doing. And I've been so impressed with this message this week, so motivated by it, that I want you to feel the same things, but feeling is not enough. This young bride-to-be probably had all the feelings in the world, but she still had to accept the proposal. She still had to make the trip. She still had to say the vow. Then the wedding was complete and the new life began and everything changed. I'm gonna pray for you. We're gonna sing one last song and I trust that we're gonna live thinking about our lives and the lives of those around us in a different way. Father, thank you so much for, for times like this, for messages like this that are unsettling, where we have to choose whether or not we're going to think honestly and deeply about our own lives. And just like Jesus has repeated this, almost as a theme, throughout the gospels, we continue to visit it as a church because it's important. And just because it's uncomfortable, certainly nothing we should ignore. So I pray for my friends and for myself that after re-examining our own hearts, that we would accept the responsibility that you've put us here with a purpose, for a purpose to partner with you take responsibility for the world around us, not to condemn the world, not to further drive wedges between us and people who you desperately want to reach, but to extend a hand as a neighbor, as a friend, pointing people toward the power of the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because after all, it's only Jesus who saves. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.